Hello, happy Friday. Welcome to today's live coding train stream. Um, this is how I feel today. Um, somehow I'm gonna uh, wake up and uh, do some coding. Um, but uh, today's gonna be a little bit different than usual. I have a short period of time now, and then I'm gonna take a break and I will come back and do some more. And I'm very excited because I am going to do some tutorials, a little bit technical today, uh, but I'm going to do some tutorials on a concept known as higher order functions. And I'm also gonna do some tutorials, <laughs> I'm getting excited about it, on a topic known as inheritance and, oh, I don't have my, my soundboard isn't working. <laughs> but you might be able to hear it through my microphone if I just play it out through the speakers. And Polymorphism. Woo. All right, <laughs> that's the only time I'm gonna do that. Uh, oh, am I smaller than usual? I might be. So, um, um, I, uh, la if you, you might recall last week's live stream, I had a little bit of fun with this uh, pendulum, double pendulum coding challenge, and I made myself really tiny, and I put myself inside the code. So maybe I should be a little bit bigger. I just it doesn't say it's saved where I, I, I don't have, and so here we go. Uh, is that a little bit better? How's that? Look better? Um, so I have been a, uh, you know, historically, <laughs> I'm histor me as a historical figure, has been a programmer who mostly has always worked in Java. Actually, one of the first, well, if I go back all the way, one of the first programming languages I ever used was BASIC, and I did a little bit of BASIC on an Apple II Plus in about second or third grade, if I remember correctly. Um, and then I really didn't program at all until around age 29. <laughs> um, and that's when I learned programming using the Lingo programming language. And then after that, I learned Java. And then after that, I discovered processing. And for years and years and years, I used processing, which is built on top of Java. I did a little C++ here and there, but everything I did was always object-oriented. And my brain, calcified as it is, really just thinks in object orientation. And there's all sorts of new and amazing functional programming patterns and techniques and strategies that people love and adore. And so, you know, I'm gonna dip my toe in that a little bit today by, uh, talking about higher order functions. Coded Drain is brought to you by coffee. I don't usually, usually I try not to have coffee with these live streams because I'm already kind of like hyper and insane, but I, uh, today for some reason, I, there's a couple of things going on. Number one is I, um, had a very strange night of sleep, which just the sleep thing didn't work for me last night. That happens every once in a while. And then I also, on this morning, uh, was on the New York City subway, which was actually kind of lovely. I got uh, stuck in between stations, in between 14th Street and West 4th. Um, there was a, a smoke issue or something. I haven't looked in the news to see if there was anything uh, significant, but the train was stopped there for about 45 minutes. So I kind of like half fell asleep on the train while I was waiting, but didn't really. I was listening to podcasts, and I just feel completely off. Which is too bad because um, today I do have, I really want to get stuff done and I will be out of, away. I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm not available next Friday. So the next live stream after today will be two weeks from now. So I thought I wanted to just mention that. Um, oh, getters and setters is something I would like to get to today as well. Um, so the, uh, okay, but hold on. Let's, before I even get into any of that, I want to just mention again that there is a new, the Coding Train website. I, I am trying my best to um, always update and place a note here when I know when the next live stream is going to be. I did used to have a schedule of multiple weeks ahead. I mean, the, it was useful for me to try to keep myself organized, but to be honest, I never really kept to it. Um, but that's something that I could, and so, oh, and look, tune in live. I wonder if it says this when I'm live streaming, but are it just, uh, so let's click that. <laughs> well, this is like coding train recursion here. <laughs> we'll, let it, we'll let it go one more time. So, um, so that's what I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to mention, look at this, woo! Let's see if we can get a nice little ripple going. And one more, one more, one more. 
Here we, here we come. Here we come. One more. One more. Oh, I didn't do another one. Who knows? Anyway. Okay. I, I lost my I lost my train of thought. Oh my god. And now it's zooming. I'm losing. Ah, I'm going crazy. All right, but so I wanted to also just mention, so there's a lot of, this website is amazing. Thank you to Niels Webb for doing uh, uh, almost entirely all of the development. There have certainly been other contributors that you can look in the GitHub uh, contributors. Thank you also to Austin, who has been doing a lot of design iterations, uh, working on this like interest, cool animation that when you hover over the card, it like changes color. So there's some other things coming to the site. Mostly what I want is this for this site to be a way that people can find the videos more easily. And, um, uh, in particular, I get the question a lot of like, where do I start? So I, I would like to create a page that's maybe like for beginners. Anyone wants to help contribute to that? Uh, check out the GitHub issues on the uh, GitHub repository and please contribute. Now I will go here to coding challenges and I'm going to go here to double pendulum. So this was my most recent coding challenge. If I clicked here, I'd get to the video. If I click here, we get to a page where you can download the code. You can run the example in theory. Let's see if that works. There we go. There's the example running in uh, JavaScript. Uh, and then you can also, this is what I wanted to know most, add your own version. So all the coding challenges now should have this page where you can see contributed variations by uh, community members. And the credits are here, the link to it is here, source code. And if you click on these links, there will be some instructions. It's not the simplest thing in the world. You have to use some markdown syntax and we're using this thing called Jekyll. There's I, I, I would love to just spend a whole day going over the sort of like open source development of this website to help people contribute to it, but that's not for today. But let's click on this submission from, thank you, Don Wilson. And, ooh, awesome, I love this already. So here we have a double pendulum. One, one thing I love about this that I didn't do in mine is I'm pretty sure I can click on it and I can kind of drag, let's drag this one. Interestingly, um, if I click on this, I can't pull, yeah, I don't have to use, if, if you look at my inverse, one thing could be added to this is from my inverse kinematics tutorial. I have basically a tutorial that almost does exactly this. If I pull on this, I could pull the whole pendulum out and feel more realistic. But what I love about this is, let's, let's try to pull this all the way up to give it some, uh, and so I can change in real time, I can change the lengths of these arms, I can change the mass, I think it would be nice to see maybe the size of the dot change when I change the mass. That could be some useful visual feedback as well as the gravity. So I can make it super strong or zero. <laughs> That's kind of fun. No gravity at all. And then obviously here's the dampening. If I make that you know, small gravity with, high, with pretty high dampening, it's going to come to rest very soon. So, um, oh, look at this. I'm Simon in the chat sent me a nice diagram about getters and setters. Thank you. All right, so it's very hard for me to see. Uh, thank you in, to the, in the Patreon group where you send me images, it kind of fills up the whole chat because I have everything zoomed in on that computer. So it's, it's great and helpful, but um, it's actually more helpful to me to just have short lines of text if you're trying to get, um, get something across to me in the chat. Okay. I see that people are saying that they're gonna submit their Minesweeper one. People are giving me some smiley face emojis. Wake up, wake up, wake up. I don't have my, just out of curiosity, how much can you hear this? As always, I always forget the this stop, this stop, this stop, this stop, I do this stop, this stop, I do this, this stop, this stop, this stop, I do this stop, this stop, I do this stop, this stop, this stop. So that's just playing out through the speakers of this iPad in, in through this microphone, which is here. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm really excited about this higher order functions things, but I feel like today is not the day. Today's not really the day for me to do anything, but I've got to do it. All right, so let's think about this. Um, let me get a code editor up. I, 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 I'm thinking about switching over to Visual Studio because um, everybody says I should, but then I, I get kind of obstinate and think like, nah, I don't want to use the thing that everyone says is the coolest thing, it's the best thing. I just want to use my thing that I like, that I'm comfortable with, because why not? Um, so uh, neural network coding train, let's close this out. Um, let me go to uh, terminal here. I am using the P5 manager. Uh, someone in the patron Slack channel suggested creating a kind of variation or on P5 manager that's like a tool, command line tool to generate coding train project templates. So that's a really interesting idea. 
uh, g dash b um, higher order. Let's just call it higher order, higher underscore order. CD higher order. Uh, let's run. A lot of this I'm going to be able to just do in the JavaScript console. And uh, so now I'm serving up that page. Whoops. Uh, let me come back to here and open it up in Atom. And go to sketch.js and get rid of this. Get rid of this. And go here. I'm so lazy. Someday I'll just make a template for myself. Uh, let's go here. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to the browser. Localhost. Open up the console. Oh, I have my notifications on today. I need. I didn't. I forgot to configure them. So what I try to do. Uh, just for those of you, uh, is like if the microphone breaks or something, if you're in the patron group and in the Slack channel, you can send me a um, at Schiffman and it will appear onto my watch. Please do not abuse that. <laughs> Emergencies only. Uh, because, uh, but I, unfortunately, I'm getting some other nonsense on here, but hopefully, I won't get any other text. I, I meant to turn that off. So, anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, Background zero. Okay, this is working. Wonderful. All right, we are set up and we are ready to go. This is my soundboard fail, and here we are. By the way, anyone wants to do a like totally random, nonsensical study on my typing, the E key on this keyboard, I'm, I'm getting a new computer soon. The E keyboard on this computer just keeps getting worse and worse. I think I've now almost like trained myself to hit that key harder, but um, like right now I'm gonna hit E. That worked. It didn't work. Didn't work. Worked. It works like 50% of the time. <laughs> I'm just curious if anybody can like notice how I'm like going really slow or how many times I type E, it doesn't work. How much is this affecting? Maybe the whole coding train stuff is just no good anymore. The tutorials are, don't make any sense. They're not interesting to watch. And I'm a little worried it's because of this E key and the fact that I feel like <laughs> today. <sighs> All right. Oh, look at that. Mm. Okay. Uh, triple pendulum. I do intend, by the way, um, in my course that I'm teaching, so the reason why I'm covering this today is the topic in my course that I'm teaching right now at NYU is uh, particle systems. And so I've been using uh, higher order functions, array functions, to manipulate arrays of particles in interesting ways. And so that's why I wanted to make some videos about that and we'll apply it to the particle system examples. Coming soon are tutorials about physics engine, and I did a bunch of these last year, but it'll be interesting to remake the double pendulum. I mean, it actually exists already, I believe. I think if you go to uh, matter.js is a physics engine that I use in some of my tutorials. Um, and I believe if we see all these demos, one of them eventually will come up and be, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so I, I kind of, it, it, it was there really quickly. Can I go to demo? Oh no. Uh, and go to, um, which one is the double pendulum? Double pendulum. So there you go. It's very, um, so it'd be interesting to remake this and in matter.js and just sort of see how that compares. And then, you know, we could do a triple pendulum, all sorts of interesting stuff. So I'm, I'm, that's coming. Um, all right. Now what happens if I Google higher order functions? And if I image search that? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, a high, okay, so I'm just gonna talk about it myself. And I'm gonna go to Mozilla Array. And I'm gonna end up here. All right. Ah, so William in the chat asks, please, some JS beginning lessons. So my beginner playlist is, if you look on the YouTube channel, it's called Foundations. <laughs> That's the word Foundations in JavaScript in the title. I don't remember what it's called otherwise. All right. What's the chance this works? Very little. All right. 
Here we go, everybody. Um, Roshan in the uh, chat asks, in the YouTube chat asks, how do we contribute to the Coding Train website? So I, I, uh, it's actually not immediately obvious because there's not, I don't think there's a link on the website currently to the GitHub. But um, actually there are because everywhere it says how to contribute, it goes to the GitHub, so never mind. But if you're looking for it, it's actually the, the, the um, repository has been renamed. And so this is now the GitHub repository for the website, github.com slash coding train slash website. Something that would be wonderful actually, that I could really use a contribution for are unit tests. And in particular, making sure the um, markdown files are, that people are pull requesting are formatted correctly and the Jekyll build doesn't break. And so um, I would be happy to set up this website as a continuous integration with uh, Circle CI, which is a company that sponsored some previous tutorials that I made, um, and have unit testing because I, there's a lot of pull requests coming in, and I, I just like I like to just merge them and not check them, and then the site breaks, and then I realize like oh, I probably should check them or have some unit tests. So that would be a great. I mean that's not a that's not a um, exa exactly a beginner friendly uh, way to contribute. Um, beginner friendly way to contribute would be to. Uh, um, a beginner friendly way to contribute would be to continue filling out the, tutor the, the videos. So right now I believe, if you go to coding challenges, oh sorry, the content is all in these underscore, um, underscore topic name uh, directories. So if I click on coding challenge, you'll see this is a markdown file for each and every coding challenge, and this is what gets rendered onto the website. So most of these are all here. They might be missing some related links and things, but um, in, in theory, the idea is to have a markdown page in this repository that renders to an HTML page on the website for every single video I've ever made. And you know, if we go into tutorials, there's, well, there's a lot because people have been adding them, but there's a lot missing. So any help with that would be wonderful, and that's a little bit more beginner friendly to help with, and there's also a community contributions guide on the wiki, uh, which is content contribution guide is what you want to look for. So if you want to submit your own code that you made based on a video, that would be here. If you want to submit something, um, um, if you want to help contribute to like pages that are about the videos here. And then of course, if you're a designer, um, if you have some ideas for how to improve the navigation or language, if you're a copywriter, um, all of those things um, would be, uh, w I would love help with. Okay. Um, there's so much noise in the hallway right now. Can you do something like Barnes Hut method at some point? Sure. Oh, you know what I want to do? I want to do something. I need to remember this, but um, in a, I wonder if I could do this today. No, probably not. <laughs> but I want to do a quad tree stuff because I'm, that's something that is missing from all of my nature of code tutorials. And I want to look at how to optimize for. Um, kind of collision detection and things like that. Um, so I gotta get to that at some point. Uh, okay, we gotta get, gotta get started here because it's already 11.35 and I was gonna, this is like the first part of the live stream, I'm just gonna do a little bit and then come back later. So I gotta, kind of, I'm just like introducing everything and I'll be like, oh, I have to go. What do you think? Does this better with the cap? Nah. Hello, welcome. Um, this is a video tutorial, and this is really just a, um, you know, always at the beginning I need a little take two. <laughs> Hello, welcome to another video that I'm in. I just make so many videos, but this is another one. I'm actually really quite excited about this. I'm going to talk about in this video something called a higher order function. And uh, um, uh, as if you followed my tutorials and things over the years, I'm kind of like an old Java programmer. <laughs> Probably the language that I've programmed the most in is Java, and specifically processing, uh, which is a development environment built on top of Java that I use. And so I really was taught and have learned and have practiced like object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming. <laughs> I love object-oriented programming. But there is this thing called functional programming, which is very popular. Uh, and interesting, and I'm, uh, I want to dip my toe a little bit, and JavaScript is a, a, a language where functions 
are the sort of primary building block of the language. And there's lots of things. And of course, you can do this, I know, in Java now with like Java 72, whatever version is now 100,051. Um, um, but I want to look at this idea of a higher order function and kind of, kind of wade into this idea of functional programming a bit more. Now, this video is appearing in my ES6 playlist, even though some of the stuff that I'm going to use is not ES6 specific. But I think it's useful to have it here because I'm going to use in these tutorials also this particular syntax known as the arrow syntax or the arrow function. And I'm going to use that. And that's only available in JavaScript ES6. And if you are confused about what the arrow function is, <laughs> magical tutorial about that in a separate video. And I think I talk about ES6 versus ES5, which are different versions of JavaScript there. OK, so what is, I'm going to attempt to define <laughs> what a higher order function is. And a high, I, what I, the way I like to think about it is like, well, there's a function. I could define a function like this. Function hello. And then I could write console log hello in there. And that's a function. It's a named block of code that I can execute by calling the name of the function. And there's lots of ways to declare functions in JavaScript and with ES6 syntax. And I could say var hello equals or let hello equals or const hello equals. So many possibilities. This is not a higher order function because it is just a function on its own, on the level playing field of functions. A higher order function is a function that kind of has two levels of functions to it, or more than two. In other words, what if this function expects as its argument another function? So you're calling this function and sending it a function. That's a higher order function. Or what if this function actually makes a function or returns one back to you somehow. That is also a higher order function. So any function that either takes a function as input or sends a function out as output, that is known as a higher order function. And you can do all sorts of kooky, interesting things that, can, that look kind of fancy, that can be fun, but also can make your code easy to write. Um, so I, the reason, one of the reasons why I'm doing this is there are a lot of higher order functions available for JavaScript arrays. And those are really useful. Let me name a few of them. Uh, map, sort, reduce, filter. So uh, in the subsequent videos that are following this one, I'm going to start going through these functions. And it's my goal to actually then tie these functions into a particle system example because I want to look at, well, you know, I can look at the, how these stuff works and just put numbers in it, but what might be an actual real life scenario in the sort of creative coding graphics world that I might use them in? So this is the whole landscape here. I'm going to start with just basic higher order functions. I'm going to write a couple like goofy, trivial examples. I'm going to stop. <laughs> I'm going to come back and start going through higher order array functions uh, and then try to like tie that into a particle system. That's my plan. I know that sounds fine. I think it's okay. I don't know. There could be a better plan. I'll come back and make these videos again another day. Here I go over here. All right. Oh. Let me check the, while I'm taking this little moment, let me check the, um, let me check the, returning the function is called currying. I did not know that. Okay, so far so good. All right. <laughs> I'll do my fake walking over here again. All right, so let's try to look at this idea of uh, passing a function to a function or returning a function from a function. Uh, so let's, uh, I have a sort of empty bit of code here. I've got the P5 library loaded. I don't need it for what I'm going to demonstrate, but it has a nice setup function, which is like the window on load function. So I like to have that available to me. I don't actually need to do this in setup, but I'm going to anyway. All right, so let's say I were to define a function, and I'm going to call it um, um, sing. And in the function, I'm going to say, la, 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 la. And then when I'm done, OK, no, so let's just do that. <laughs> OK, this is my function sing. Oh, I got to make it, I got to make it in the global space so I can call it from the console. <laughs> the setup function is totally irrelevant at this point. I don't know why I talked about that. Um, so I have this function called sing. So now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say sing. Song, song, ba -ba -ga. sing. Ah, oh, I reload the page. Sing, la, 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 la. All right. Now, Craziness. 
What if I were to define, what if I were to say, hey, this function takes as an argument another function, and that might be called like a callback. And when I finish singing, I execute that function. So you can see this might, this, this might be code that you've never written yourself, but it's code that's happening all the time in JavaScript libraries that you use. Because a lot of times you say, hey, load this JSON and here's a callback. Or do this, but apply it with this function. So this is the idea of if you could send in a function, right? The parentheses aren't here, right? Because this is actually the name of a variable, the name of the function. It's the parameter to sing is callback. And if that is a function, I can execute that function here. So in other words, I could say, now in setup, I could say, I could make my own function, um, sing, uh, what would be, so what's something besides singing, <laughs> which I could do, uh, meow. And I'm going to say console.log meow, meow. And then I'm going to say sing meow. And actually, let's just, let's do this all in the, con I'm going to um, put this here. And then I'm in here, right? One thing, now what happens if I call sing? It says callback is not a function. So I didn't pass that parameter. So I have to now say sing uh, meow. And then I'm giving it the meow function, so sing la la la's, and then it executes that meow function. Now I could be sort of thoughtful about this and I could say like, oh, only call the callback if it exists. Uh, what did I get wrong here? Whoops. Um, so now I could do some error checking in my function. So I could do this, and it's okay for me to say sing, it just does la la la, or I could say sing, and then when you're done, execute meow. And if I wanted to be really, really, really careful about this, I think I could say as long as it's an instance of a function. Who knows if that's right? <laughs> um, so I could say sing meow, and then sing and it would still work. So um, this is this idea of being able to call a function from a function. Okay. Let's look now at, well, okay, well, uh, hold on a second. Um, um, This is kind of, this is very basic and sort of nonsensical, but I'm going to keep going. I'm just sort of thinking here for a second. Um, okay. Um, I should also mention that I'm kind of writing this code in a very long-winded way where I'm naming all of my functions. And this is not what you would typically see as JavaScript programmers do. And eventually I'm going to be like peeling this away and having anonymous functions and eventually getting to this arrow function again. So for example, just to make this case clear, probably another way that I might do this is say, oh, I want to call sing and then I just want to add pass in another function to it. So you can see here, this is me calling the function sing and giving it an argument, which is all this code, which is a function definition with no name, an anonymous function. And this might look even more clear to you if I do this, right? You can sort of see like this is the whole argument being passed in between those other, <laughs> my head's blocking, those other two parentheses. So that's a whole function definition just being passed right in. And, you know, spoiler alert, I could kind of write it like this with arrow, but we're going to get back to that later. We're gonna, I'm going to come back to the arrow function later. Okay, so one more thing let's try. So this is a function that you're passing a function. Another thing you could do is I could have a function return a function. Some might even call that like a function factory. Ooh, if you're a Java programmer or something, you love factories. Okay, um, so let's get rid of this. And I'm going to use a pretty standard example. It's probably one that you would find in countless other tutorials. Um, and I'm going to write a function called multiplier. I'm going to show you why this is useful. And what this function, well, first of all, let me just call, write a function called multiplier and give it an argument called factor. Um, give it an argument called x and an argument called factor. And I'm going to return x times factor. So this is a general function that's just going to take two numbers and multiply them together. So if I load the page here, I'm going to say multiplier x oh, 5, 2. And what should I get? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, let's try that again. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Multiplier <laughs> 10. If I say multiplier 
3 comma 9, 27. I'll make a little calculator here. Okay, but what if I want to actually create different functions that multiply by different factors? So instead of, um, instead of having x here, what if I just said return a function that receives x and multiplies it by some factor? Look at this. The multiplier returns a new function that uses factor that was passed in. Whoa. So in other words, what do I mean by this? I can now say, whoops, and I'm just using the console here, so let me give me more space here. Let me make this a little bigger. I can now say, let, let doubler equal multiplier two. Whoa. What is doubler now? Right? I didn't get it. Is it a number? Did I multiply something? No. I created a function. I created a function that uses the number that returns x times 2. So if I were to say let tripler equal multiplier 3, now I've created a function, right? We can actually just double check. Let me just say what, what this doubler is. Look, this is what doubler is. It's this function. Now x times factor, it's showing me that. Whoops. What, what, did I, what did I get myself into by clicking on that? Ah! <laughs> Come back. Uh, are, are we still there? No. Okay, hold on. Uh, hold on. Shoot. Let me, let me recreate what I just did for the purpose of editing. Now, it's still showing me factor here, but really inside that function, it's holding on to that number two that was passed in. So in other words, if I were to say doubler four, what am I going to get? <laughs> no, I messed something up. What did I do wrong? Oh, it doesn't say, oh, this has to say, ah, oh, oh, I have a mistake. Look at this. I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. This is a fine mistake for me to have. Right? It didn't return anything. Undefined. I forgot to also have the return here. So this is kind of weird looking, but this multiplier function makes a function that returns x times factor. So now if I start over here and I say let doubler be a multiplier, create a function with a factor of 2, and let tripler be a create a function with a factor of three, now I can say uh, doubler four and I get eight, or I can say tripler four and I get 12. Okay, so this is this idea of higher order functions. You can either have a function that receives a function, maybe it takes some time to do a lot of things asynchronously, so it can execute a callback to alert the caller of the function that you're done. This is what you might write into a programming library if you're writing a JavaScript library and you want to uh, offer callbacks. Or it can be a function that returns a function if you want to be able to generate functions based on a set of parameters that you're using in various places. So this is really just the basics. I'm going to stop it here and I'm going to move on. And instead of writing my own higher order functions, I'm going to make use of other higher order functions that are wonderful and excellent and exciting in, the, in JavaScript arrays. Okay? Thanks for watching. I don't know where this pen came from, but I have it in my hand. And it makes a funny little sound when I do this. I was about to say when I click on the whiteboard, but there's no clicking because it's just a whiteboard. Okay, see you later. Um, yeah, closure would be good for me to mention. Oh, I forgot to use the arrow function here. Ugh. Yes, okay, hold on. I forgot about that. Hmm. Hmm. All right, uh, let me think. I, I would like the arrow function. I can mention closure and arrow function. Uh, all right, let me just, I will finish the tutorial again. So I'm going to repeat whatever I did over there, but I'm going to, from here. Oh, all right, actually two things that I forgot. Number one is, um, this can also be, this is also an example of a closure. 
meaning that when you create this function by passing in factor, this like kind of closure bubble lives on and the value of factor is retained, even though it's sort of technically a local variable just to this function multiplier. So this is a, I have another video all about JavaScript closures and this is an example of that as well. And then I forgot, this is a case where I can use the arrow function to make this look you know, nice and clean and simple. Uh, and you know, I'm very torn about this because on the one hand, the arrow function can make code look very cryptic and confusing. On the other hand, it can really simplify things. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. So um, uh, what, what does the arrow function do? So um, this is actually, if I just rewrite this function down here, this is what I've written. So the arrow function, you can watch my arrow function tutorial, allows me to, first of all, instead of saying the word function, I can delete the word function and I can put the arrow here. So this is a function definition with one argument x and this is the code that the function executes. Now interestingly enough, if there's only one argument x, I don't need the parentheses. So if there were two, if this were a function that's like multiplying two things, I have to keep those parentheses. But if there's only one, I don't need them. So now I've simplified it like this. It also so happens that if there's only one line of code in that function, you don't need the curly brackets. The curly brackets can be assumed, and I can now write it like this. And guess what? If there's only one line of code, the return is assumed. So I can actually get rid of this return. So actually, this is a completely identical way to write the function up here. So what this can actually be now is this. Uh, so this is what I mean. This, you might look at this and be like, what in the world is it doing? But after you use, and I can speak from experience because arrow functions were brand new to me like less than a year ago. <laughs> but after you use them more and more, it starts to seep into your brain a little bit, like whether you're doing some mental gymnastics to translate it back or it's just kind of intuitive. But there is a nice quality to saying like almost like x transforms into x times factor. And it's, it's confusing because that return is returning a function but that function is returning x times factor. So let's take a look, hopefully I got this right. Let's take a look at this, and I'm gonna uh, refresh here. And I'm gonna, uh, did I save? I'm gonna save, refresh, and, and what I'm actually gonna do is, let's just put this in the code. Let's just say, uh, let multiplier equal, um, oh sorry, let doubler equal, um, and let's get rid of this, should not be here. Let doubler equal, um, and I can. I don't need the setup function. I'm being so silly. Let doubler equal a multiplier to let tripler equal multiplier three. Oh, and I got to have the i there. Okay, so I made those two multiplier functions. Refresh. I hit doubler four. I get eight. And triple or four, I get 12. So wonderful. Look at that lovely use of the arrow functions and higher order functions. So we're do I'm done now with this video. What I've really just discovered here basically is that a higher order function is a function that either receives a function as a callback, and if you're writing a JavaScript library and you're asking people to call functions that happen asynchronously, this might be something you provide as an option. Oh, if you send me a function, I'm the library, I will execute that function for you to let you know when I'm done. So that's a very useful technique that you'll see in P5 and all sorts of JavaScript libraries. So receiving a function as input or returning a new function just like I demonstrated with that multiplier function. So that's the basic idea. Now, I am not going to write my own higher order functions right in the next videos. I'm just gonna make use of some useful ones that happen to live in the JavaScript array uh, object. So I don't know which one I'll start with. <laughs> Tune in to the next video to find out. Ooh, suspense. And I'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Uh, okay. Yes, I could have. <laughs> so uh, I think I'm gonna, um, I could have, though someone in the chat is pointing out that I could say this. I mean, but uh, is the, would I ever want, no, let multiplier equal, sorry, factor this. Right? Is this right? Oh my God, I hate this. Do I need to, uh, do I need to put parentheses around anything here? Ugh, 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 I do not like that at all. <laughs> that, that hurts my brain. Um,
It is pretty cool though. So uh, that's a little like, maybe I'll put that in the YouTube description or I'll pin that as a comment as sort of like an interesting thing. I mean, the thing is, uh, for me, and I, maybe I'll just talk about this in the, when I get to the next stuff, okay. What time is it? Noon. Uh, all right. What about neural networks? Maybe I could just pour this coffee directly on my head. I'm just curious. I'm just sort of curious. I'm going to put up a straw poll here. This, um, is this new? Totally new, never seen it before. Not new, but so helpful. I know all this. I, I should probably give you more options than this. Um, but I'm just curious for people watching right now, I'm going to uh, post this little straw poll here. I'm going to create the poll. Uh, in terms of the topic that I'm covering, I, I, I have a feeling that for the larger YouTube audience, it is very different than the core live stream audience. But um, here is the straw poll uh, URL. If somebody in the, who has moderator privileges in the YouTube chat could post that link, um, that would be super helpful. I'm just sort of curious to get a sense of what the audience is thinking. <laughs> all right. Boy, I really need to do this like every day to get to all the topics I want to get to, but hopefully I will get to everything. Um, Dan, can you say why JavaScript is the most loved programming language for you? It is not the most loved programming language for me. I have like a love-hate relationship with JavaScript. Actually, I late JavaScript. I have JavaScript. I love it. I hate it. I love it. I hate it. I late it. I late JavaScript. Um, but it, I, the, one of the reasons why I love it is it uh, it's, uh, works on the web. It's the language of the browser. There's so much that you can do with it. Um, and I like the sort of informal nature of it sometimes. With, um, um, but you know, if I were to say my favorite programming language, I don't have one. I don't know. It's, it changes from day to day. Um, all right. Let's see. Currying. Yes, currying. Um, all right. So let's, just curious. Let me just see. Uh, totally new. Never seen it before. Wow. 50%. Um, I know all this, not new, but so helpful. So it is. So 70% um, this is like actually is like a useful instruction. <laughs> you know, that's like, you know, I'm sure if uh, someone can, this is like a bad use of polling. Anybody listen to the 538 podcast, good use or bad use of polling? Nate Silver would not be happy with what I'm doing here, I'm sure. <laughs> so this is like totally misleading and like uh, problematic, but it's a, it's a little bit of a test here. Um, we can see this is nice to see that there is actually, it's not that everybody watching is like, I know all this already. Um, all right. So now, let's come back to let's think about this. What do I want to do first? Let's do the map function first. Um, what did I say here? Filter? Map reduce filter. Filter. Yeah, map reduce. Let's just actually, I think I could do all of these in a video. Why not, right? Instead of doing like separate videos on each, and then I'll just do them with numbers, and then I'll go to like a more complicated example with actual stuff like the particle system and go through that. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm just going to check the, you know, and we're good, we're good. All right. Welcome back, baby, or welcome for the first time. Who knows? This video now, I am going to talk about these higher order functions. That's really just kind of me like trying to sound smart and make it sound fancy. These are just functions that I can call on arrays in JavaScript. So you might really think of an array as like, oh, array. It's a list of stuff. It's an ordered list of things. Like it might be an ordered list of numbers like this. And I can iterate with a for loop. I can, uh, you know, use uh, I could, that kind of thing. I could iterate with a for loop. <laughs> like, how would I calculate the sum of everything in this array? I would have a for loop, and I'd 
start with this variable sum equals zero, and then I add the first element, then the second element, and the third element. So what I'm saying is that these higher order functions, these array functions, allow you to manipulate the array as a whole all in one fell swoop. And you actually have seen this before if you watched any of my videos. For example, push. This is not a higher order function because it doesn't receive a function as an argument. But um, this is not a higher order function because it does not receive a function as an argument, but it does, um, it does manipulate the array. So if I say push and I pass in seven, then it will add an extra element to the end of the array. Now what it's actually doing behind the scenes with all that is a topic of discussion for another time. What I want to look at is, let's look at these four. So where do these come from and what do they do? Um, so over here, this is the um, Mozilla Foundation web docs. There are lots of places to find resources about what the various things available in the browser in JavaScript are. Um, but this is the JavaScript array object. And so the array object, this is how you might think of it usually. It's got two things like a string and you console log the length and you get two. But if I go over here to the left, I'm gonna see, oh look, all these other functions. For example, and they're listed here as array.prototype.push. Now I do have a video about what the prototype thing is. Luckily, what I'm doing now is I'm living in this world of JavaScript ES6, the version of JavaScript 6. And you don't really have to mess with the prototype too much. And that's another topic for another time. But, if, but this is where I can find the list of the functions. Um, so if I click on push, I would find like, oh look, this is what it does. If I say animals.push cows, now I have another uh, element in that array called cows, a string called cows, which is at the end. So let's, let's try to decide what should we do first. Let's look at the map function. Let me just discuss what each of these do. Um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at the map function. So I am going to um, awkwardly, I'm trying to think, actually, what's the best way for me to demonstrate this? An interactive console would be so much better if we were on the same page. I wonder if like using code pen and having the console up and open, or should I just live with my weird Adam and clicking back and forth? Um, anybody have any suggestions? Oh, Phil. Yeah, I forgot about Phil. I'm trying to think here. Uh, hmm. So like, for example, what I'm gonna wanna do is like have an array. I guess I can just write all the code here and then hit refresh over here and see the result. Split screen with console above your head. Hmm, interesting. So like, do this more. Hide the sidebar and Adam. okay. Um, close pane. View, ooh, there's a GitHub tab. So many things I don't know. Visual Studio Code. <laughs> it has a console in it, doesn't it? But I like Adam, it's nice to me. I can also just do this. It's kind of a work. I'm kind of into this. Let's give this a try. It probably has a console plugin. I'm just, you know. All right. <laughs> I'm going to go for this, see how it works. Okay, so to demonstrate this, I'm uh, this is a little bit silly, and I know those of you who have more sophisticated workflows will complain, but I've got my text editor here and the, the browser console up here. So if I were to write something like an array, I'm going to call it let uh, vowels equal 
um, you know, four, eight, one, two, nine, and I were to say console log vals, hit save and go up here and hit refresh, I see it there. Okay, so this is gonna be my workflow right now to demonstrate, type some code down here, refresh and see the output up here. So, what if what I want to do Oh, right, let's see, what, what do I want to talk about first? Let's do, we're going to do the math function first. And uh, um, the chat reminded me that there's also a function called fill, which um, I could, I mean, there's just so many more. So, you know, the point of this is for me not to like teach you how every function works, but to get the basic idea. And then you can kind of learn to, and go through and read the documentation to figure out what some of those other functions are. But anyway, back over here. So what the math function does is it allows me to, um, to pass a function that's applied to every element of the array. So for example, if I were to write a function and call it doubler, and it gets an x, and I say return x times 2, then I should be able to say vals.map doubler, and then console.log vals. Now, I'm going to leave all this here. So let's look at what's going on here. Um, I have the array, I'm going to look at it, then I'm going to define a function called doubler, then I'm going to pass doubler via the map function to vals. So I should see the array have 8, 16, 2, 4, 18. Now it's not going to do that because <laughs> I made a little mistake here, but let's take a look. So now I'm going to come up here, hit save, I'm going to come up here, hit refresh. And we can say, oh, look, why? I got the same values both times. How come it didn't change? Well, one of the things that's important to note is that these functions, uh, they, they all behave differently, but um, these functions return a new array. So it doesn't actually change the values in the original array, it creates a new array and then puts all the double values in it, or the, 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 the new values that are applied from that function. Oh my god. <laughs> I just break my glasses. <laughs> that you can leave in. <laughs> um, that's good. These are new, too. I really don't want to break them. The lenses are old, but I, I broke my glasses, so I bought the same frames again. They're new. Okay, sorry. Um, so, <laughs> there's going to be more ads you're going to see on the YouTube video soon because I broke my glasses. I have to pay for them again. Glasses are expensive. <clears throat> okay. Um, what was I talking about? All right, I get a new array. <laughs> um, so, let's look at what am I going to do. So, I could say something like let doubled equal vals.map doubler and now I could console log look at doubled and let's take a look at what that does. I see now there we go. I've got all the elements and the mouse is in the way, all the elements doubled. And if I wanted to use the same variable, you'll see this very commonly, I could say vals equals vals.map doubler. So let's look at that and now I'm going to say console log vals Oops, and I gotta go up here, and there we go. So this is now, let me give myself a little bit more space here for the code. This is now, now everything I need, right? I have an array, I have a function that does something to a number, and then I can say take that function and apply it to every element of the array, and give me a new array, and overwrite the previous variable with that new array. So here's the thing, this is great to learn, uh, super useful. It's nice to have it kind of in this, and I'm going to even shrink this. I'm going to use the arrows. I'm going to use, oops. This is great to learn. <laughs> um, it's really it's useful. It allows you to write code kind of simplified. I'm going to simplify this really down by using the arrow function in a second. But I should note that from what I understand, this is not necessarily high performance. So if you have super large arrays, you can imagine like recreating a whole new array, passing a function, as opposed to just using a for loop. Using a for loop might actually run faster. Most of the stuff that I'm doing, this doesn't really matter. You're working with small arrays and software web projects. You know, these higher order functions are going to make your code nice. And also, here's the thing. This is one of the reasons why I'm covering this is like, if it were just me living my life, I would just be using for loops. I would never bother with any of this. Because, but that's wrong. I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. But that's, some of them I'm sort of stuck in my ways. But you, you will be going to tutorials. You will be going to open source projects. This is what people are doing now. They're using these higher order functions and they're using the arrow syntax. So you want to get some facility with it so as you read other people's code and you contribute to open source projects, you can participate with this new stuff. 
All right, now let me do one more thing to this. Let's get the arrow syntax in there. So first of all, we know that I could improve, not improve this, but I could make this an anonymous function. So I could put this in here. So now this should be the same exact code. I'm going to refresh here. Still works, but now it's an arrow function. So I don't have to say, I, I don't, it's the same function, I can put the arrow. It's just one argument. So I can get rid of that. It's just one line of code, so I can get rid of that. It's just one line of code, so I can assume the return statement. And, oh, look at this. Now look at this. Oh, I, so I have to admit, I really do like this. <laughs> I, I, I pretend that I don't, but it's so kind of nice. There's something lovely about it, right? I have my array, and I say, hey, just double everything. You know, take x and arrow it over there to x times 2. So now, if I save this here and hit refresh, ah, oh, I made a mistake. Oh, I have this extra, this semicolon here is actually kind of unnecessary and I guess caused a problem. And there we go. So look, this is even nicer. That semicolon made it kind of, so this is wonderful. Oh, look at that, vals equals vals dot map. X goes to X times two. Um, while we're here, let's look at fill really quickly. Fill will take an array and fill it with values. So I'm going to comment this out. What if I were to say vals.fill and um, uh, zero console log vals. Now let's see. Let's see what happens. Ooh. Oh, that actually, so interestingly, this acts on the current array. So the fill function does not create a new array in return, but acts on the current array. What if I were to say fill random 10? Am I going to fill this? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Am I going to fill this with a random values? Oops. Got to come up here. Uh, random is not defined because, oh, okay, I'm just going to say math.random. I'm not in P5 world in this video. I'm going to say math.random. Am I going to get a new random value for every element of the array? Whoops. <laughs> Shoot. No, look at this. 0.14, 0.14, I mean, you'll have to trust me, 0.14, 0.14, those are all the same values. Because, note, I'm executing that random function and, um, and picking a random number and then filling it with that same random number. But this fill is a higher order function. I wasn't actually using it as a higher order function. I was just giving it a number, so I wasn't passing in a function. If I wanted to pass in a function, I don't even, I'm, not, I'm just going to go straight for the arrow syntax here x, and I'm going to say math.random times 10, and I'm going to say math.floor in here, because I want to just see some integers, right? Look at this. Ooh, did I get this right? So this is now an arrow function. Fill each value x by executing math.random times 10, and then floor. Well, let's go up here. Oh, what happened there? F, F, F. Oh! Phil works in a different way than I think. Phil isn't, oh, Phil is not a higher order function. Oh, cruel, cruel world. I have to use map. <laughs> I was just excited to, okay, we have to go back. We have to, we have to go back. 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 <laughs> is there anything left in this mug? Oh, well, it's like a little bit of drip. There's a little drip left in there. Sometimes I like to just design programming languages. I just make it up. I just make it up. Make it up. I can't get this workflow down of just going back and forth between these things. Oh, how can I get that same 0.14? How many times will I have to refresh this until I get 0.14? About 100 times. Probably less than that. Oh, well, 0.13 was good. <laughs> I have to use map instead. Um, 
Okay, there might have been a weird edit point there because I went off, I kept going like in this like magical thinking. I was like making up features of JavaScript and I started trying to explain how this is not using fill as a higher order function. I'm just giving it a number. But what if I gave it a function? Fill doesn't work that way. So this is where map does actually come in. If I wanted to fill all of these with an individual random number, I could do that by saying map x this. So this would give me map this function of returning a random number. If I hit save here and I hit refresh, whoa. Oh, and then of course I forgot that um, I do need to return the new array. And there we go. Now you can see they each have a different number. Now I should say this is a little bit weird. Like if I wanted to create an array of random numbers, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't like start with like a fixed array. Like what if I want to have an array of 100 numbers that are random? Well, one thing I could do is I think I could just say new array 100 and then hit refresh here. No, it's empty. So the reason what I need to do is I think I need to also say fill. That's weird. This is so weird. Oh, I don't like this anymore. Dot fill dot map. Yeah. So why do I need to do that? Because it has to, because if, what, so what if this is undefined? Can I still get a random number? Oh, you mean I can just do this? No. X slots available not used. So if, oh, just math random. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, okay, ha, ha, okay. So this didn't work, right? It's just empty times 100. So this is unfortunate. Like even though I made a new array with 100 spots, because there's nothing actually there, I can't start to process it this way. So I actually need to use fill first. So I can, and I can chain these. So I can say, let me fill the array uh, with zeros and then map it. Now, I'm gonna, so this should work now. And this is getting a little convoluted. Why do I care about doing this? I don't know. <laughs> you can just turn, you just go to the next video. I'm gonna keep going with this just for a little bit longer. So now I'm gonna hit refresh. Now I have an array with 100 random numbers. But look at this. You know what's interesting about this? I created a function, and I, I think this also doesn't really matter, right? I could just do this, and it works, right? Because I don't need, I'm not basing it on x. But incidentally, what is this a function? This is a function that returns math.random. Well, what is math.random? It's a function that returns a random number. So I could actually do this, just write math.random, right? I could name, that's a named function. Don't execute it, just pass it the named function. So this is a way of creating an array with 100 elements of it that are all random. I think this is gonna work. All right. Yay, da, 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 da. sound effect that doesn't work right now. Um, so there you go. So now you've got a little bit, I'm gonna, this video I think is gonna end now. Um, you've got a little bit about map, this idea of higher order functions and array uh, arrow syntax, uh, map and fill. So what I want to do, I could do sort here, oh sort would be nice, but I, I'm gonna do these in different videos, I guess. Um, I'm, let's look at reduce. Reduce is a kind of complicated one, um, so maybe I'll do that in the next video. Okay, I'll see you uh, in. I'll see you uh, be, when I reduce myself. <laughs> uh, okay. Right. So I could have done this. Yeah, let's. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> just back for one brief extra thing. Um, you know, just, just because while we're at it, if we're doing all this crazy condensing everything into one line and these things can be chained, this can actually go right here. So I can actually now have this in one line of code, which is to say, make a new array, fill it with zero so something's in there, and then map the uh, random function to it. And then 
It still works. And as a special treat, I will now foreshadow the use of reduce by uh, reducing myself to a tiny, 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 tiny little person. Okay, I'm reduced. Goodbye. See you in the next video. The new is not needed? Ugh. All right, all right, everybody. Uh, all right. <laughs> so, you don't need the new. I like having the new there. It makes me feel comfortable and happy. I have to go soon. Um, Zero in fill is not needed. Okay, okay. So hold on. Let me let me redo that part of the tutorial. <laughs> I'm gonna redo that whole thing. Oh poor Matthew. <clears throat> Maybe. What did I do when I came? Let me actually, maybe we can go, we can skip, Matthew, this might, edit might work better if we skip the part where I came over here, blah, 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 and then went back and then added something. Let's just do this again. Okay. Okay, there was a weird edit point there because uh, the chat, the live chat that's going on while I'm recording this um, gave me some helpful tips here. So a couple things. Number one is if I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like the kind of person who wants to just write everything, the, the thing you could do in one line of code in 15 lines of code. But if I wanted to keep going with this, I could, in fact, I don't need to have vals create a new array and then have it used here. I could just put new array directly right here. And in fact, I don't even need the new keyword. I could just actually say array 100. And in fact, because ultimately, I'm going to fill it with random numbers. This zero is totally irrelevant. I can just fill it with undefined. I just got to fill it with something. Map doesn't work unless the array has filled with something, even if that something is undefined. So this should actually work. Here's an array with 100 spots, random numbers. Yay! OK, so now what I'm going to do is I think this video is going to end. Um, I've, I've talked about fill. And I've talked about map. I think I'm going to reduce as a kind of complicated one. So I'm going to do that in the next video. Um, and um, I'll start it with a, I'll, I'll reduce myself. I don't know if that's worthwhile in the next video as well. And I get sort and filter I'll get to at some point as well. So let's look, let's look at reduce next. Thanks for watching. Yeah, I liked having new. So it should have new, right? But whatever. Oh, and this should be let. Ah, fine though. Come on, I can't get it all right. That's going to have to be good enough. <sighs> um, Thomas is asking, will you do a tutorial on ML5.js? Yes, eventually. Not today, not right now though. Um, all right, I'm gonna, let's try to do reduce and then I'm going to take a break and come back this afternoon. Okay, um, thank you, Simon, for your example for reduce. That's basically the same example I'm going to demonstrate, how to sum up the entire array. Um, okay. I'm thinking. Um, oh, let me. Should I shrink myself again? Sorry, I'm just taking a momentary pause to look at myself in the monitor, <laughs> apparently. Uh, all right. I just think what I want, I, I, yeah, I'm going to just hard code an array because I don't want to have this nonsense fill thing. Okay, there, there we go. All right.
This is going to be oh so much fun. Uh, five, four, one, two, nine. Um. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, I don't even have my bell. <laughs> Hello, it's me. I'm tiny. I'm up here in my code. Oh, it's over here. This is the array. Oh, it's a nice array. I'm going to be here talking about reduce. So I reduced myself to a very small person, but I am going to uh, uh, un unreduce myself back to my normal size to talk about reduce. That, that was totally worth doing, <laughs> wasting the first 30 seconds of this video for that bit of shtick. Okay, um, so reduce. This is a really interesting and kind of weird and quirky higher order functions for arrays. And what, it, what it's generally, the reason why it's called reduced is let's say I have an array and I want to take this array and I want to just, I want to find out the essence of the array as a whole. I want to reduce it into one thing. So that's what this does. Now there's lots of ways, reasons why you might want to do this, but I think probably the simplest scenario to start with is oh, I have an array and I want to add up all the numbers in it or I want to average all the numbers in it. So let's look at how that works with reduce. Right? First let's actually do that without reduce, just to, just to kind of like get the hang of things here. So if I wasn't using reduce, I would say for let i equal zero, i is less than vowels dot length, i plus plus, and I would have a variable like let sum equal zero, and I would say sum plus equal vowels index i, and then I would say console.log sum, and I would refresh up here, and we could see, there we go, all those numbers add up to 21. <clears throat> now, if you've been paying attention to my ES6 videos, of which this is in a playlist, I could also say for let val of vowels. So this is kind of like a kind of like a for each style loop. There is actually something called for each in JavaScript with a little bit different. Also a higher order function that you can pass. Anyway, but um, this is saying every val inside of vals, and oh, of course now I don't have that index, I would just do this, add them all up together. So this is reducing it a little bit, reducing the code a little bit, and if I hit refresh, I've also got 21. So how do I use this reduce function? Let's actually go to the, uh, actually I don't, the browser is weird now. Um, hold on. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's see how this reduce function works. Do you guys hear that? Can you hear that? It's like the, the film class back there, and I don't have my water. This, it's okay, I'm gonna get to go soon. <laughs> Come back later. <laughs> yeah, I know I could use for each. Um, yeah, I would really love to be able to just like walk around the screen as a tiny person and point to stuff. Someday I'll get that set up. That'll be fun. Um, all right, so um, where was I? All right, so let's look at how this reduce function works. And actually, before I act, write the code, let me come down here and let me go and look at the documentation. So I'm gonna look at reduce. So reduce is a function that has, that takes two arguments. And there's a way of doing it with one argument, which I will get to at some point, an accumulator and a current value. What does that mean? Accumulator and a current value. Accumulator and a current value. So <clears throat> this is not, reduce takes a function. It's a higher order function. So let's write a function that has both a uh, an accumulator and a value. So I'm gonna get rid of this code. And I'm going to say function, and I'm going to use ACC for short for accumulator and val for value. And I'm going to say return accumulator plus value. Hmm. 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 Okay. Return accumulator plus value. I think this is right. Oh, and let me name this. Called, I'm going to call this sum. Now I'm going to say vals.reduce sum. And I'm going to say let result answer equal that and I'm going to say console.log answer. And I realize I kind of just typed this out and I haven't really explained it yet because to be honest I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing just yet. But hopefully this is going to make sense that I can back, it's going to work and then I can back up and explain it. Let's see. Ah, I got the answer 21. Okay. So what does this do? Well, do you remember when I, ah, let's, let me go back to my old code. I'm going to just quickly 
copy this. And I'm gonna go, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to here. What if I actually called this ACC short for accumulator and then said ACC plus equal val? Well, the accumulator starts with zero and then every val is added to it over and over again. <clears throat> this is the idea of reduce. You give it something that's going to persist over time as it's looping through ele every element of the array and then you can act on that thing that's persisting and the actual value of the array. Now, in this case, to, um, to add them both together, all I want to do, uh, to add a sum, I just want this accumulator to always persist and just keep having each val added to it. Now, what's the weird thing about this is, what's the value of accumulator? Like, what does it start with? Well, interestingly enough, let's see if we can determine. I'm going to add console.log accumulator in here. And I'm probably going to need a bit more room in my console, so I'm going to do that. Look at that. 5, 9, 10, 12, 21. Interestingly enough, the first time I ran the code, the accumulator's value was 5. This is because I did not provide an initial value for the accumulator. So if you do not provide an initial value for the accumulator, it will, by default, be the first thing in the array, which is 5. Notice now, if in here I say reduce sum, and then I pass a second, a second argument. So sum is this function, that's, the, that's what I'm passing to reduce, but there's an optional second argument, which is referred to as the initial value. So if I want the initial value of accumulator to be 0, I didn't have to do it for this problem that I'm solving, but I could do that here. Now I'm going to hit refresh. And oh, and let's look at what it did. Notice that it started at zero. So I have an extra console log. It, actually, it didn't actually bother to run it with the first value because it just started accumulator as that value but the previous time, but now it's doing that. So just to be, make it clear, if I say 10, right, if I start accumulator at 10, can take this out. What should the, think about pause and think about what am I going to see in the console. Refresh. 31, right? Because I added all the numbers starting with 10. Okay. How can I condense this now? Well, first of all, I can use the arrow syntax. I can get rid of the word function. I don't need it to be named. And it's one line of code, so I don't need the curly brackets, and I don't need the return. So this actually can now go right here. And this is now, I'm going to give myself a little more space. This is the full line of code. I can say, hey, take this array and reduce it with an accumulator of a starting value of 10, and for each value, add that value to the accumulator. And now, what if I wanted to do the average? If I wanted to do the average, I'm going to need two lines of code. So I'm going to have to add these curly brackets back in. And I'm going to say, um, oh, no, I wouldn't do that in here. Never mind. Let's just pause before I said average. Because average, I would just say answer equals, <clears throat> you know, I would just like divide this by vowels.length. So. Oh, okay, wait, wait, wait. It's not a default start value of zero. It's a default start value of the first element of the array, which is different. Um, array reduce, whoa, max. I'm just looking at some of the. Oh, so I did say it correctly. Okay, good. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else I should demonstrate here. And this is the basic idea. I'm trying to think of this one other example. Like I could, I could like concatenate a string. Um, that's sort of the same thing though. I mean, join does that. Uh, finding min and max is a good idea. Okay, 
And I wouldn't do that with filter. I'd do that with reduce. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. Okay, so in this case, though, if I really just want to calculate the sum, which I can call this sum, I don't want to start with 10, so I'm going to do this. And just to be aware, just to say it again, this is very important, especially once you start having like arrays of objects and other things, the accumulator, if you don't give it an initial value, is not starting with like a default value of zero. It's actually starting with whatever the first element of the array is. So if you ever see this code, and I'm going to do this soon enough in a future video, where this is an array of particles, I might want to do something to say, calculate the average, the centroid of all those particles. I'm going to have to be clever about how I think about doing this. Okay, now, uh, the chat gave me a good suggestion, which would be to find the maximum or the minimum of, and of course there is, I think, in P5 I know as a min and max function, there's probably a native JavaScript one as well, but let's try to do that. Let's try to find the minimum and maximum using reduce. So let's, I'm going to write it out the long-winded way because this helps me. I'm going to say find max, and actually this is great because this relates to some of my uh, neural network videos that I've been making, um, where I'm, I'm going to have an accumulator and a value. Okay, now if value is greater than accumulator, accumulator should equal value, right? Accumulator doesn't have to just be a thing that you're adding up together. You're saying it's just a variable that's going to persist while I'm going over the whole array, and value is each one. So if that current value is greater than whatever the accumulator is, then I'm going to get, um, then accumulator should equal that value. And then, I guess, do I want to, do I need to return the accumulator? Or does that, by definition, no, yes, I need to return the accumulator, I think. So let's see. <laughs> let's take a look at this. So let's say let biggest equal vals dot reduce find max, all right? So, and then uh, let's console.log biggest, nine. That's the, now, let's put nine in the middle because just to be sure that it's really working because it was the last element, nine. It still worked. So I definitely need to, and if I take out this return accumulator, yeah, I don't get it. So of course I need to return that, right? Because the whole point is I am going to return at the end. It's kind of, you sort of get into this, it being assumed that value that persisted over the whole time. Now, how can I reduce this? So first of all, I can make this, as we know, an arrow function. So let's actually do this. And I'm going to put this here now into here. So this works. This is a little bit awkward looking, but this is definitely kind of functional style. I'm going to reduce that I have an accumulator and a value. I'm using the arrow syntax and running this code. Let's make sure this still works. Whoops. I get nine. Now, I could probably use, I think it's called a ternary operator if I wanted to be this crazy person who is, um, crazy person who is reducing um, who is like, uh, so if I want to be this crazy person who's like always trying to get the code to be shorter and shorter and shorter, let's try to remind ourselves what a ternary operator is. Um, all right, so I think it's got a question mark and a colon, right? I can, I, I just like, I, I never, oh, where am I going? Ah, let me come over here. Oops. All right. A question mark and a colon. So if I'm saying, If A is greater than B, uh, A, B equals A, right? I can re reduce this, just using the same words here, to, by saying uh, question mark. Wait a sec. <laughs> oh, I lost my train of thought. Right, yes, yes. Oh, well, this is crazy. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thinking about this. Um, okay. I'm sorry, sorry. So, but this, okay, so this is an if statement. If A is greater than B, B equals A. But I could also sort of think of this as if A is greater than B, I might say like return, right? If it's greater, A is greater than B, then A is the, the new bigger value. Otherwise, return B is the new bigger value. So this kind of statement can be written in with a ternary op operator by saying, question mark a colon b. So I can get rid of, oh, I, I don't like what I'm doing today. I can get rid of this if and these returns and I basically have evaluate this Boolean expression. If it's true, here we got a. If it's false, here we got b. So in theory, I believe, oops, in theory, I believe that I could, let's change these actually to A and B, which is fine, accumulator and value is kind of useful, but I could say uh, A greater than B colon, oh no, question mark, uh, A colon B. I gotta give myself a lot more room here. Did I get this right? Oh, it's right. Let's look at this. Is this really right? Oh my goodness. Ugh. Ah, this really freaks me out, but it's okay. It's okay. Everything's going to be okay. I've got too many mouse things everywhere. All right. Let's think about this again. I'm taking an array. A persists over time. Oh no, wait. Is this right? See, I, I lost my, my thoughts about it because I like, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. A is the, is the accumulator. B is the value. If value, I, yeah, I, it's funny because I was thinking about it the other way around because I think what I want to do is say if the value is greater than the accumulator, then return the value, otherwise return the accumulator. They're really the same thing. But um, so let's see if this works. I should get nine. Nine. I still got nine. So the idea here is that I'm saying reduce this array. Have a, val have a variable called A, the accumulator, that it persists over time, and then look at every value B in the array. Start with five. If B, if, it's, if four is bigger than five, that's your new accumulator. If nine is bigger than five, that's your new accumulator, which it is. If two is, oh, no, is two bigger than nine? No. Is one bigger than nine? No. I'm left with nine. So, ah! Hopefully this is kind of helping you. These are two scenarios now. We've now seen where this is like a nice little snippet of code to find the largest value in an array. And this is a nice little snippet of code, if I put it back, to find the sum of all the values in the array. And both of these, the initial value is, is, is assumed. For example, just to be clear about this, what if I put 20 here? If I put 20 here, if the accumulator starts as 20, what am I going to see? 20. And then the sum is 21, right? So it's going to be 20 because none of the numbers are bigger than 20. So this could also be a test like, hey, find me the maximum value in the array, but if nothing is bigger than 20, just stick with 20. So, but if I said, if I said 8 here, I'm going to get 9, right? So this initial value is assumed to always start with 5 but unless you explicitly initialize it as something else as the second argument to the reduce function. <gasps> okay. So, boy, I don't know how I feel about these functions, but at least I've covered them. I've tried to explain them. You should let me know in the comments, because I don't know, I felt pretty good about map. I felt like if you're watching that video, it made sense, you could find use of it. This reduce one is really confusing, and it takes a lot of practice, especially as we like condense it shorter and shorter with the arrow function. So let me know how that goes. I, I'm going to use it with a particle system um, in a future video that will hopefully be linked from here somehow in a magical way. Um, so that might give you more of a sense as you see it uh, used in a practical scenario where you're actually doing some graphics and animation. So um, next video, I will talk about filter. All right, everyone.
Boy, this stuff takes so much longer. Reduce write. What's reduce write? I gotta take a break now and go have some lunch. Previous value, cur oh. Oh, I don't want to cover this. <laughs> it goes right to left, but that's, I, I should mention it. Um, all right, everybody. So I'm going to need to take a break now. I have a meeting and I'm going to grab something to eat. Um, I hope to come back around, I mean, 2 p.m. would be the earliest. Um, more likely something like 3, which is, I'm talking about Eastern time, which is about uh, two hours from now, and then I'll probably do another hour or two of live streaming. Boy, I'm really not, this, I take so much longer to get through stuff. So, um, where, so what I want to do, let's think about what I'm going to do. I'm going to do uh, filter. I guess I could do sort, filter and sort, whatever. Uh, and then I need to do inheritance of polymorphism and then the particle system stuff. Wow. So many things to do. Okay. Um, so, uh, Any questions for a minute here? Maybe I'll figure out my soundboard issue as well. Check my email, all that sort of stuff. Okay? Everybody good? Take a break, go stretch, do some jogging, dance to some music, that sort of stuff. All right. Um, I will be back later. Thank you for tuning in. I don't have any music. I can do this. I can do this. I'm seeing that people are requesting phone gap tutorials. There's so much to cover. I can never possibly do it all, but maybe someday. Ah, all right. Um, so uh, Siggy is asking, what are you going to do with the particle systems? Well, what I was gonna, one, thing, one thing I did with my class this week is I used the filter function to filter out particles that are off screen, for example, and like get rid of them out of the array. Again, I don't know if that's the most efficient way of doing it, but it kind of is a nice demonstration. So I'll do that sort of stuff. So I'll be back within one or two hours. Okay, thanks everybody. See you later.